Natural law pluralism refuted number 16. Number 16, and we've come to the New Testament. We're going to look at uh, how natural law pluralists pervert the teaching of the New Testament. We'll analyze Van Drunen on that. Uh, I have a couple of things to wrap up from the prophets, just some concluding material, but it'll be primarily dealing with the New Testament today. And I'm going to read from Romans 3.31 and then Romans 8. Do we make void the law through faith? Certainly not. On the contrary, we establish the law. And then flip over to Romans chapter 8. And I'll read 1 to 8. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made us free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, and that it was weak through the flesh, cried God did by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh. On account of sin, he condemned sin in the flesh. In order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For those who live according to the Spirit, those who live according to the flesh set their minds to the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. To be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is empty against God, it cannot be subject to the law of God, nor it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can be. So then those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Just a clear passage about uh, Christ came so we could obey the law in sanctification. We have to be justified and saved by Christ in order first to be sanctified. So we have a couple of concluding things from last, uh, last time. Natural law in the hands of the unregenerate throughout history has led to the deification of the state and the view that the state is mankind's savior. Now I'm bringing this up because this idea that we can be neutral and that we can have a uh, kind of common grace civil government that's going to be fine for everybody and we don't want to have a state that's explicitly Christian. This idea is just insanity. Without Christ, men act as God. Now the reason for this tendency are not that hard to figure out. And this tendency, I'm talking about why the state ends up proclaiming itself to be God in a sense, either implicitly or explicitly. When men do not believe and confess that the earth is the Lord's, and that he has all authority, and that rulers are only his ministers or servants, they look at reality or nature autonomously. They affirm that the state or civil magistrate uh, or the civil magistrates as representatives of the people are the source of authority, morality, and dominion. There are natural laws to be learned within and without man, but due to sin in man and the effects of the fall outside of man, the heathen only get a few things right on a surface level. We keep emphasizing that. That's what Paul says in Romans 2, 14 and 15. He's not saying, oh yeah, they have the whole law on the heart and they can do wonderful things. He says they have the work of the law written on the heart. Yeah, they get some things right and it's enough to condemn them before God. And the unbeliever's reasons for law are always idolatrous. Remember, behind law, what is the foundation of law? The foundation of law is always religious in origin. It's always religious. The old pagan nations attributed divinity to the leaders and the king's and or the king's special connection to the gods as a justification for his authority. We find that in Samaria, Babylon, Assyria, the Canaanites. We find that in the Rome. We find that all over the world. The right-wing Enlightenment thinkers, they gave us the United States Constitution, spoke of natural law, but left the Bible out of the picture as an authority over man's subjective interpretation of natural law. There is natural law, we don't deny that, but you need the Bible to tell you how to interpret natural revelation. Voters had certain rights, but there were no religious test oaths on a national level. And thus, 
in this system that people become the ultimate authority, theoretically. The people become the ultimate authority. And we see that in California where they, they did, you know, we're going to have a vote. We're going to have homosexual marriage or not. Let's just vote on it. Let the people decide what right and wrong is, apart from God. When men do not have special revelation as the ultimate and sole authority that is used as a judge over a man's interpretation of history and natural phenomenon, men are not really ruled by natural law but by sinful man's subjective opinion as to what natural law teaches. <clears throat> Authority and the definition of morality is thus not the word of God, but rather a, uh, but rather a single leaders or a body of rulers or judges or the people's sinful subjective determinations. Without the limitations set by the perspicuous, infallible, perfect word of God and the biblical teaching that God is the only true source of law, the state, whether the old pagan nations of antiquity or the modern secular humanistic nations, assumes independent authority and claims total jurisdiction over mankind and the world. The natural law pluralist in rejecting the abiding authority of the first commandment over nations. You know, except for Old Testament Israel, they would say. Has denied the true God as the source and foundation of law, leaving a vacuum to be filled by pagan man's idolatry. Now remember, natural law teaches the true God. It's revealed, the true God is revealed in nature enough to make man responsible. We're told that in Romans 1 very clearly. Psalm 19. Uh, Heavens declare the glory of God. But we're also told in Romans 1 that all men suppress that truth in unrighteousness. It's a suppressed truth. It's a suppressed knowledge. And in the process of suppression, they always create idols. So it's not going to be a reliable source of ethics. So it's filled by a vacuum. The vacuum is filled by pagan man's idolatry. The point here is that all attempts to sever the first table of the law from the second table leaves the second table on a humanistic, idolatrous foundation. See, what Van Drunen wants to do, he wants to get rid of the first table and replace it with natural law. It doesn't work. Consequently, instead of a state that uh, respects the authority of different covenantal spheres, for example, the family, the church, and the civil magistrate, all different covenantal spheres, that understands its limited jurisdiction and purpose, and its subjection, its own subjection, to a higher transcendent law, the state assumes a position of divinity. It claims to be God, as God, determining right and wrong, winners and losers. The modern anti-Christian state claims jurisdiction from cradle to grave, from womb to tomb, over welfare, over education, over worship, the family, business and family, capital and labor, and everything. Total jurisdiction. What Van Drunen proposes not only has never worked in history. Note, for example, King Nimrod and the Tower of Babel incident but also Samaria, Assyria, Greece, Rome, Persia. But it cannot work, for it leaves sinful autonomous man on the throne, not Jesus Christ. You see the point? You need the foundation of law to have good law. You need, the, you need to have the proper foundation of law to have good law. The supreme efforts of autonomous man to make up laws, predestinate the future, and save mankind all end in dismal failure. Because men approach the raw materials of reality with God suppressing wicked presuppositions. The biblical solution is found only in Jesus Christ the Savior and Messiah, who as the exalted Lord over all, restores men to a right relationship to the one true God. That is what we need to be working for, not some kind of neutral sphere of natural law.
He has laid a new redemptive judicial foundation for civilization. Because by his blood and victory, his victory over death, he restores the first commandment in individuals, families, and eventually whole societies. You see the importance of the gospel? The gospel restores the first commandment. It restores the first table of the law. So men can live in peace with God. And once they live in peace with God, then they can live in peace with mankind. Van Drunen and the natural law pluralists on the issue of civil magistrate and Christ's authority are the false prophets of the American anti-Christian civil religion. The humanistic concept of conscience by denying the lordship of God makes inescapable the tyranny of men. Every man's conscience is made by humanism an absolute lord. The student, student rioters of the 1960s and 70s. The anarchistic revolutionaries. The civil rights protesters. The sodomite rights and transgendered lobbyists. All claim the right by conscience to destroy law and order and overthrow biblical, a biblical society. Evil men have never produced a good society. You say, well, America was pretty good for quite a while. Well, yeah, America was essentially a Christian nation. Christian worldview dominated everything. The Constitution, with all its flaws, was hev heavily influenced by Christianity. The Constitution uh, teaches that the, the state is not to be involved in uh, welfare programs and those kind of things. The state is here to provide law and order for a good, lawful society. Christ came to save the world, folks. The gospel, church planning, and teaching the whole counsel of God, including the lordship of Christ, is the key to social renewal. Van Drunen has given us a theology little different in its implications than dispensational fundamentalism, which says, eat, meet, retreat, and wait for the rapture, the great escape. Leaves, he says, look, leave society in the hands of the heathen. Leave society in the hands of atheistic naturalists. Leave society in the hands of the secular humanists, because we're all simply under this common grace, co Noahic covenant, where God doesn't concern himself with idolatry and Satanism and history. Now, if you want to believe that, if you think that's logical, if you think that's biblical, uh, you might want to uh, put the medical marijuana away. And then we come to our next major point. Van Drunen's understanding of Christ's teaching on the law. We're going to look at Van Drunen in the New Testament and his, uh, his r really a kind of a radical form of dispensationalism extends into the New Testament. It's really quite shocking. Van Drunen's reformed dispensational understanding of the Mosaic Law is on display in his interpretation on the Sermon on the Mount. I have a lengthy quote of his, but you've got to pay close attention to this because it's shocking. Here's what he says. This is from pages 454 to 455. This is Van Drunen. Quote, a common reading of this verse, and he's talking about Matthew 517. I, I didn't come to uh, get rid of the law, to destroy the law. I came to fulfill it. A common reading of this verse among Reformed and other interpreters is that Jesus intended to clarify the Mosaic Law in response to the Pharisaical corruption of Moses. While this reading has the virtue of guarding against the denigration of the Mosaic Law, it is not an adequate interpretation of Jesus' words. Generally, it fails to reckon with the eschatological newness of the coming of Jesus and his kingdom so emphasized in the preceding text in Matthew. Matthew 5.17 reinforces the sense of eschatological newness. For example, the first use of the key synoptic phrase, I have come, hints at Jesus' heavenly origin and authority and indicates that Jesus is about to reveal the central purpose of his ministry. In addition, his denial that he came to abolish the law of the prophets indirectly offers further evidence of the newness of the kingdom. 
Apparently, what has transpired thus far in Matthew's story, Matthew's story is so different from past experience that it gave some people the impression that Jesus had come to abolish something in the Old Testament. More concretely, the way in which Jesus' commands unfold in Matthew 5, 21 to 48 is incompatible with reading them as clarification of the Mosaic law in opposition to corrupt Jewish interpretation. For one thing, all six of Jesus' you have heard statements either quote or paraphrase the actual teaching of the Mosaic law, not contemporary Jewish interpretations of it. Jesus compares his exhortations to the Mosaic law itself. Okay, so his, just stop for a moment. His position is, is that Jesus is refuting the law of Moses. The law of Moses is defective. We need a new, better law. That's basically the old dispensational opinion. It is not the position of any Reformed commentators that I can find. Second, continuing. Second, though the first two antitheses are amenable to the view that Jesus is purifying the interpretation of the law, the last four antitheses cannot reasonably bear such a reading. Jesus shows the inward demands of the prohibition of murder and adultery in the first two antitheses, but whereas the Mosaic law prescribed the procedures for divorce, oath-taking just retaliation, and the destruction of enemies, Jesus prescribes them. To say, for example, that what Moses really intended by writing, keep your oaths, was that the Israelites should not swear at all, strains the imagination. Furthermore, Jesus' statement about divorce in, in Matthew 5, 31 to 32, which presumes that the death penalty is not applied against adulterers, cannot be an elaboration of the Old Testament law. See Deuteronomy 22, 22. Okay, uh, let me stop for a second. We'll see. He doesn't understand the law. He doesn't understand the New Testament teaching on the law. He doesn't understand either one. And I'll demonstrate that very clearly in a moment. A better reading of 517 is that Jesus fulfills the law and the prophets by accomplishing all the things that the Old Testament prophesied. To this point in his gospel, Matthew has already labored to show that Jesus' actions constitute a turning of the ages and bring to pass what the Old Testament foretold and anticipated. 122 to 23, 25 to 6, 15, 17, 23, 3, 3, and 4, 4, 6, 7, 10, 14 to 16. And this theme continues in all sorts of ways subsequent to the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus' words in 518 can form a historical and eschatological interpretation of fulfill in 517 by saying, until heaven and earth disappear, and until everything is accomplished or comes to pass. Jesus, I conclude, indicates in 517 that he neither abolishes the Hebrew scriptures, nor simply purifies them from corrupt interpretation. By his deeds here also, by his words, Jesus brings along the prophets to a historical and eschatological fulfillment. Thus, since the kingdom of heaven is something new, Listen carefully. The Sermon on the Mount, as the ethic of this kingdom, proclaims an eschatologically new way of life. Okay, he's saying Jesus is teaching a new, a different ethic than the standard of ethics in the Old Testament. This is new. This is an eschatological ethic. It's new. Here's what he says. He continues. Quote, Jesus intended to set forth a new a way of life different from life under Moses though it reflects the same divine holiness and accomplishes rather than thwarts God's larger purposes in giving the Old Testament law and prophets. End of quote. Now, before we look at the proper interpretation of Jesus' teaching, it's worth noting that the view that Christ is correcting perversions of moral laws in the Mosaic Code that were being taught and popularized among the people by the scribes and Pharisees is the standard Reformed interpretation. Now, before I continue, I have to. Here's a, a quote by Rush Dooney in my conclusion of my last message I forgot to read. Here's what Rush Dooney writes. Unregenerate men can go so far in history and no farther. They are plagued by sin. So their most eloquent dreams mock them <clears throat> because man remains man in the process and he pollutes everything he touches. The mark of the liberal and radical is his belief in the natural goodness or at least the moral neutrality of man so that he sees evil in institutions in the environment rather than in man. Change the world around man, a man, and a perfect, happy, and united humanity will result. The nature of the humanist faith is his trust in man and man's future. Man shall prevail. Man is autonomous man, sovereign man, and man's future will be one of total victory without God. 
End of quote. That's a great quote. That's from Salvation and Godly Rule. This idolatry which currently dominates the worldview and thinking of the intellectual elite in the West will result in judgment and disaster. But back to the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, Van Drunen has completely abandoned the old Reformed interpretation that Jesus, he says, look, I didn't come to destroy the law. I've come to fulfill it. Now, and then Jesus goes on and he contrasts false teaching of the Pharisees which the true, with which the proper interpretation of the law in Moses. He's not giving us a new, different law. Van Drunen says, yes, he's giving us a new, different law. Van Drunen's view is the common Anabaptist <coughs> radical discontinuity view, still held by most evangelicals, that Jesus gives us a new law, a different superior ethic. This interpretation should not surprise us, for Van Drunen has a very low view of the Mosaic Law as it pertains to Christian sanctification and as a guide for civil laws and nations today. He rejects the Mosaic Law, let's face it. The Mosaic Law does not really apply to us or society, so we must follow natural law instead. We will demonstrate that Van Drunen's interpretation is incorrect by the following observations. First, while we agree that Jesus fulfilled the prophecies and personally obeyed God's law in exhaustive detail, okay, the word fulfill is a very rich word, and it does apply to that. There's no question. Jesus did fulfill the prophecies perfectly. He did obey the law in exhaustive detail. He had to, to fulfill the covenant of works so he could impute his righteousness to our account. The context and specific words used by Christ support the traditional interpretation. The Jewish people were concerned, about the, were concerned that our Lord was going to destroy the law. The word here for destroy, kataluo, translated destroy, the King James, New King James, or abolish, abolish, the New American Standard Bible, the NIV and the RSV. In first century Greek literature, with regard to law, meant to deprive by force, to annul, to abrogate, to abolish, or repeal. Look, I didn't come to abolish the law. I didn't come to get rid of the law. I didn't come to destroy the law. I didn't come to abrogate the law. I did not come to a, a, repeal the law. That's what Jesus is saying. The same word is used in Greek literature to des describe destroying or demolishing buildings. The word destroy contrasted with the word fulfill, a word that literally means to fill to the full. The word fulfill is used of the fulfillment of prophecy very often. Matthew 1, 22, 2, 15, 17, 23, 4, 14, 8, 17, 12, 17, 13, 14, and 35, 21, 4, 26, 54, and 56, 27, 9, etc., it's also used of obedience to God's commands of the law. James 2.23, 2 Corinthians 10.6, Romans 13.8, Revelation 3.2. And it refers to everyday things like filling up a net with fish, the same word, Matthew 13.48. Or filling up one's guilt or wrath, Matthew 23.32. With respect to the redemptive work of Christ, we should interpret the word fulfill in a very broad, positive manner. Jesus did fulfill the prophecies about him and his work perfectly. Born in Bethlehem of a virgin, etc. They're all fulfilled perfectly. He did obey the law perfectly and achieve a perfect positive righteousness on behalf of his people. Absolutely true. But this does not mean and cannot mean in this context that he set aside the obligation of the moral requirements of the Mosaic law for a new, more lax or more merciful standard, which Van Drunen will call uh, the eschatological ethic. Such an interpretation violates the grammatical contrast and is irrational. Now pay attention here. Since the word fulfill is set as a contrast to destroy or abrogate, the word fulfill cannot mean destroy, abrogate, annul, set aside, or render inoperative without making our Lord's statement complete nonsense. You know, you, you come to somebody's house. I did not come to destroy your brand new Camaro with a sledgehammer. But instead, I came to destroy it with a sledgehammer. 
that's, that's irrational. It doesn't make any sense. Such contrasts do not have to be exact opposites, but they certainly cannot have the same or very similar meanings without being illogical and absurd. Therefore, the word fulfill must be in some sense contrary to the meaning destroy or abrogate or annul. The people who are listening to Christ would have thought him an idiot and would have become angry if he was teaching, do not think I came to abrogate the law, for instead I've come to bring it to an end so I can replace it with a different law. He, he didn't say that. The traditional interpretation is also supported by the context where Jesus requires, defends, and commends a strict obedience to the moral laws from one's heart, internal obedience and mouth. Okay, this idea that, you know, Van Dronen seems to accept the Jewish false interpretation of the law that it was only external. When Jesus says you got to obey it in your heart and you got to obey it with your lips, he's not adding anything new to the law. He's correcting a false interpretation. He's not giving us something new and unique from the law of Moses. Remember also, our Lord had not died and rose and risen from the dead yet. He is preaching to a crowd of Jews under the Mosaic law and is expounding the law as a standard of behavior, how to live, sanctification. He is teaching that the ethical standard of his kingdom is stricter and much more rigorous than the one advocated by the, pro, uh, the people's rabbis because Jesus does not water down the moral law or make it much easier to obey by externalizing it or circumventing its meanings by human traditions. That's what's going on here. And, you know, that's, that's Matthew Henry, Matthew Poole, that's Calvin, that's... Uh, Hendrickson, uh, Linsky, I mean, you, you name it. He's not giving us some new different law here. He's expounding the true meaning of the Mosaic law. In addition, our Lord's audience was not worried that Jesus was not going to perfectly fulfill prophecy. They weren't even thinking about that. Their main concern was that he was setting aside the Mosaic ethical standard. That was their concern. Christ is clarifying his position on the true meaning of righteousness as it relates to behavior. He is teaching that true righteousness and justice is not to be rooted in human traditions, philosophies, human philosophies, human ideas, but rather must be founded squarely, solely, upon a careful, proper interpretation of Scripture. He is teaching the same things that Paul will teach later, that number one, 1 Timothy 1.8, the law is good if one uses it lawfully. It's not good if you pervert it and twist it and corrupt it and water it down. You know, some guy says, well, you know, I'm not going to go commit adultery, but I'm going to hang out in strip clubs. That's not, a, that's not a faithful interpretation of the law of Moses. And number two, Jesus came so that the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit, Romans 8, 4. We read that earlier. Jesus came so we could more faithfully obey the law because in the flesh we can't obey it. We need regeneration. We need the Holy Spirit. We need initial sanctification or definitive sanctification, and then we need progressive sanctification by the Spirit, who enlightens our mind, causing us to understand the Word of God, and bends our hearts, causing us to love the Word of God and submit to it. We need that. Our Lord's redemptive work applied to the hearts by the Holy Spirit, our hearts to the Holy Spirit, regeneration and progressive sanctification, enables new covenant believers to be faithful to the Old Testament law's ethical requirements. This statement would be completely out of place if Jesus set aside the moral standard of the Mosaic law for a completely new law. Now, even if Van Drunen says, well, I don't think he's setting aside, well, you're saying he's giving us something new and different and that's better. So what's the difference? Second, Van Drunen's view contains a fatal internal self-contradiction. 
On the one hand, Van Drunen has told us that the Noahic Covenant and the natural law teaching therein advocates the lex talionis. That is, retributive justice must be proportionate to the offense, no more and no less. He has also pointed out that the lex talionis is a central feature of the Mosaic judicial system. But when it comes to Christ's teaching, we are told that Jesus commands, Matthew 5, 38 to 42, are different than the lex talionis. He says that on page 457. They reflect, this is uh, the same page, 457, they reflect eschatological fulfillment instead of an earthly fulfillment. The point that he is apparently making is that some sins that were crimes under the Mosaic Law are now no longer to be treated as crimes but are only to be punished at the final judgment. That's, I, you know, I'm trying to figure out what he's saying here. He writes, quote, this is from 457 to 458. The Lex Talionis prescribes a second action that is proportionate to the first. The person causing the injury should receive the same injury in return. And I would add, you know, the, the law provides a fine or the financial equivalent of the injury. You don't have to somebody accidentally smashes a guy's hand, you don't smash the other guy's hand. He has to pay a, a penalty, a civil penalty, uh, and money to the victim. Continuing with this quote, Qu quote, Matthew 5, 38 to 42 preserves the twofold action and the proportionality of the lex talionis. The difference is that his disciples themselves, the injured party, should endure the retaliatory process. Someone still bears the proportionate penalty but it is the victim rather than the wrongdoer. This reflects the larger Matthean theme that Jesus' disciples must imitate Jesus in his suffering at the hands of sinners. End of quote. That's insanity, folks. Jesus argues, uh, he argues that Jesus did not abolish the lex talionis, but rather fulfilled it. 458. Okay, it's fulfilled in him, in Jesus. Even though the lex talionis must no longer be applied as civil justice, and thus for all intents and purposes has been abrogated for society, Van Drunen believes it still applies in this new way as transformed by Christ. Therefore, he sees no internal contradiction. And then he even favorably quotes Michael Wagner, who writes this quote. This is from uh, 457 footnote 54. The calculation is the same. The price is paid, but the retribution, the thesis and point of the commandment is canceled out. That is set aside, annulled, abrogated, destroyed. Judicial process is acknowledged, yet ignored. End of quote. He quotes that favorably. The contradiction between the teaching of Christ, as asserted by Van Drunen, the teaching of the Noahic regulations, which are equated with natural law by Van Drunen, and the law of Moses, which he claims are only similar to natural law, is so explicit, I believe after careful, carefully reading his chapter, The Moral Order Penultimized, where he tries to reconcile his Anabaptist neo-evangelical understanding of Christ's teaching with his teaching on natural law, that Van Drunen is saying the church has a different ethical standard when it comes to the application of justice to violations of the law, or for Van Drunen, natural law, than the state. Okay, so there's a law for the state, there's a law for the church. They're not the same law. Well, there are a number of serious errors here. <clears throat> now, we need to remind ourselves once again, before I analyze his teaching, what I, which I find extremely unscriptural, uh, we need to remind ourselves once again that Van Drunen's book is essentially a very speculative, convoluted attempt to justify a form of unbiblical retreatist pietism that historically was an Anabaptist doctrine that had nothing to do with the Reformed faith. While it is true that many of the early Reformers appealed to natural law, they still believe that society should be Christian, not secular or neutral. They still believe that first table laws from Scripture had to be adopted and applied to society. They all did. They believed in establishing Christendom, not secular states that deliberately ignored the word of God or the universal kingship of Christ. Van Drunen and his concept of law and society, in an age when many, many nations have the light of the gospel, 
combined some of the worst features of Enlightenment philosophy with Anabaptist retreatism. We understand that a tribe, people, or nation that has never heard of Jesus Christ or the Gospel or the Bible must try to develop a law order from natural revelation as best it can. That's all they got. But what we can never accept as Bible-believing Christians is the idea that Christians in the civil sphere must pretend that Jesus Christ is not the King of kings and Lord over lords and must pretend that the perfect Word of God and the revelation of justice therein, which is the best in the world, does not exist. So we do not offend the heathen, which that's what he's advocating. Total cultural surrender. Our obligations as Christians is to look to Christ, obey his word, and teach all things that he has commanded. Our obligation is to obey Christ the King in every area of life, even the civil sphere. The heathen in a Christian society are not forced to convert, and people are not persecuted for private beliefs. But if we have the votes, we should implement an explicitly Christian constitution, a Christian covenant. You know, uh, we the people of the United States of America do hereby recognize that Jesus Christ is Lord over all, that he is the only true and living Son of God uh, on earth, and his religion is the true religion. We bow to him, we bow to his law, we bow to his word, we submit to him as a nation. There has to be something similar to that. So we have an explicit, they want to have, implement a Christian constitution, a covenant, implement an explicitly Christian law order. You know, take the, the law of God and apply it to society, modern society, as best we can. It takes, that's going to take some wisdom. The idea that covenanting with Christ and submitting to his laws is somehow unbiblical or against natural law or against freedom and liberty is ludicrous. That such unbiblical nonsense is taught in conservative Presbyterian seminaries today is mind-boggling. The OPC and the PCA are so far away from biblical Presbyterianism in its purer days. You know, 15, 1559 to 50, 1650 or so, and then you include the Covenanters. The Covenanters were quite good and well into the 1800s. Um, they're so far from that. They're so far from that that it's mind-boggling. They don't think as Presbyterians. They don't teach the establishment principle. Uh, they really, you know, they're, they believe in infant baptism and they believe in Presbyterian church government and they believe in Calvinism. But other than that, they're all over the map. All the Western nations had the light of the gospel and the knowledge of Christ and turned against them. What we need is not some speculative pseudo scholarship on how to leave society in Satan's hands, but rather a return to the biblical Christ and his word. The alternative is the Christian, uh, to Van Drunen's escapism, is the Christian reconstruction of society. It's either Christian reconstruction or it's cultural surrender, which will lead to our own persecution and Christ's judgment on our nation. Take your pick. Do you want to be persecuted because you don't love sodomy? Because you don't believe in sodomite marriage and transgendered people? Our civil leaders can kiss the Son of God and glorify God, or they can, uh, them and their kingdoms can be broken with the exalted king's rod of iron. Psalm 2, 8 to 12. That's the alternative that Scripture presents. What Van Drunen presents is bizarre. And it has nothing to do with scripture. Well, let's look at those errors. There's a number of problems. Number one, we should not interpret Christ in a manner where he explicitly contradicts his own teaching in the same sermon. You know, that's the criticism of the dispensational view. It's the same criticism as Van Drunen's view. Our Lord not only said that he did not come to destroy the law, but he strengthened his statement by adding this, in verses 19 to 20 of Matthew 5. There, whoever therefore breaks one of the least of these commandments, he's still talking about the Old Testament law, the moral law. Whoever therefore breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches men so shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does and teaches them, he shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I say to you, unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. <clears throat> 
the Pharisees externalized the law so they could keep it. <clears throat> they all had all kinds of human traditions so they could avoid it. Instead of encouraging his followers to disregard the law of Moses, our Lord insists on the most scrupulous adherence to it. Instead of requiring less from his disciples than the scribes and Pharisees, our Lord requires more. Now, the word translated break, L-U-S-E, means to dissolve, destroy, or annul. It is the simple verb of which a compound verb, katalusi, occurs twice in verse 17. Here it is translated break because it is set in parallel to doing the least commandments in the first half of verse 19. The moral law stands as much now as it has ever stand, stood. In 1 John, uh, 1 John chapter 3, the apostle is careful to remind his leaders that sin in Christian people is still a transgression of the law. The law is still there. And when I sin, though I am a Christian, and though I have never been a Jew, and I am a Gentile, so the moral law, whether moral natural or moral positive, still applies to me. It still applies to Christians. It still applies to people in the New Covenant era. Number two. The Savior's introductory formulas, you have heard that it was said to those of old, verses 21, 27, and 33, or it has been said, verse 31, or you have heard that it is said, verse 43, are never used by Jesus when quoting from Scripture. When Christ quoted from the Bible, he would say, it is written, graptai, graptai, which in the liter Greek literally means it stands written, Matthew 4, 4, and 7, uh, Luke 2, 2, 23, 4, 4, etc. If our Lord was referring to the law of Moses, uh, he would oftentimes say, Moses commanded, Matthew 8, 4. The introductory formula, it was said to those of old, has the sense of, of as taught by the ancients or the rabbis of antiquity. The designation of the men of long ago is an excellent designation for those who had orally interpreted the written Old Testament. He's criticizing their oral accretions, their oral interpretations of the law. Since the Jewish teachers at that time could not prove that all their doctrines and requirements came directly out of the sacred scriptures. They veiled the origin of them in an indefinite expression. It was said to them of old time. You go to somebody and you say, prove this from scripture. Well, it was said in the old days, you know, back in the, back in the old days, they taught this, so it must be true. Well, that's getting around sola scriptura is what it is. The Jewish audience who heard these words would have immediately understood his statement to be a reference to the scribal traditions. Number three, <clears throat> that Jesus is refuting human traditions and not the law itself can be ascertained from the antithesis, the antithesis themselves. While a superficial reading of you have heard it said examples makes it appear that they have elements that are very similar and sometimes on the surface identical to the Mosaic law. For example, you shall not murder, verse 21, you shall not commit adultery, verse 33. There are striking differences and additions that clearly have nothing to do with the Old Testament laws. The moral law did not allow men to verbally assault and insult their neighbors. There's nothing in the law saying you can do that. The law of Moses does not teach that one should hate one's enemies, but rather love them by treating them lawfully, returning a lost animal that falls into a ditch. And the Old Testament law teaches that we are not to take personal vengeance. All that comes right out of the Old Testament. The Mosaic Law does not allow unlawful lust or covetousness of another man's wife. It also does not allow easy divorce for any cause, which was the Jewish position. Divorce could only be given if an unclean thing, that is sexual immorality, fornication or adultery, could be proved by witnesses in a court of law. Okay, Van Drunen's view that you only had the death penalty in the Old Testament is clearly in error. That was the maximum penalty for adultery if you had the proper witnesses. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is setting forth the correct interpretation of Deuteronomy 24, verse 1. Everything is dependent on a correct interpretation of Irwat Debar, 
which translated some indecency, some uncleanness. Although the precise meaning of the phrase erwat debar translated as some indecency or some uncleanness, something indecent is uncertain. It is very likely that it refers to sexual perversion or adultery for the following reasons. You remember Jesus said the only cause for, for divorce is fornication or adultery. That's the only cause. Paul will bring up desertion later in Corinthians. And of course, desertion must lead to excommunication. Uh, desertion by an unbeliever. First, the phrase literally means nakedness of a thing or naked matter. The word uncleanness of a thing definitely implies a serious offense. It is used elsewhere of shameful exposure of the body. Genesis 9.22, Exodus 20.26, 20, uh, Lamentations 1.8, Ezekiel 16.36 and 37. <clears throat> it's used in, in Leviticus 18 of illicit and abnormal sexual practices. <clears throat> in Deuteronomy 23.14 for human excrement. Thus, this would be the perfect word for describing sexual immorality. It would be an inappropriate expression to describe not being able to bear children or to designate non-sexual offenses. Second, the term nakedness is used as a metaphor for sexual intercourse 23 times in Leviticus 18 alone, which deals specifically with forbidden sexual relationships. Indeed, this chapter is a catalog of sexual sins. Third, the language used in Deuteronomy 24.4, defiled, clearly suggests a sexual offense of some kind. Fourth, you know, remember Paul, he talks about how, how dare you sleep with a prostitute. You know, you're becoming one flesh and you're defiling yourself by connecting yourself to this whore. And then fourth, in Deuteron if Deuteronomy is allowing divorce only for a serious sexual violation on the part of the wife, then we have complete harmony between God's law and the Redeemer's exception clause in Matthew 5.32 and 19.9. <clears throat> this point is important when we consider the fact that our Lord is not refuting, correcting, or adding to the law of Moses in the Sermon on the Mount, but is giving the true meaning against scribal perversions. Therefore, Deuteronomy 24.1 does not justify divorce for any cause. It has to be for fornication only. Those who reject the view that sexual immorality or adultery wasn't mine, were in mind, do so on the basis that adultery was a death penalty offense. That's Van Drunen's problem. Thus they argue that the death penalty rendered divorce as in such circumstances is unnecessary. The problem with this view, which is common, is that it does not take into the account the fact that there are instances when adultery is known to have taken place but cannot be proven in a court of law. Remember, Jewish courts needed two or three witnesses. You, you know, a lot of times you can, you can find out what's going on, but you're not going to find somebody who actually witnessed it. You need two or three witnesses to get a conviction, and this was not always easy. For example, the woman caught in adultery in John 8 could not have been lawfully convicted under biblical law of adultery because the witnesses were corrupt, unqualified, and thus disqualified. You know, they let the man go, for one thing. That's John 8, 7, and 9. Yeah, Jesus is not getting rid of the death penalty in John 8. He's saying, you don't have the proper witnesses, we cannot do it anyway. Further, it seems that in the case of adultery, the death penalty was the maximum penalty under the law. Proverbs 6.35, we're still clearly Old Testament here. Proverbs 6.35 speaks to the husband who refuses monetary recompense for the man who committed adultery with his wife. Okay, the guy says, look, I'll give, you, I'll give you 200 grand. I'm sorry, I'll give you 200 grand. No, you've got to be put to death. So there could be a monetary recompense to the victim. And of course, there's the case of godly Joseph, who after discovering Mary was pregnant and not wanting to make her a public example, was minded to put her away secretly. Matthew 1.18, he was going to get a secret divorce and get rid of her. She's pregnant and he didn't do it. He didn't know it was at that time it was by the Holy Spirit. Deuteronomy 24.1 teaches that a man who knows that his wife is committing adultery but who does not have sufficient evidence for a civil trial, or who does not want to go through a trial, is free to divorce his unfaithful wife. It teaches that uh, divorce is allowed for fornication. And as we see, you know, clearly the Bible teaches that the death penalty is the maximum penalty for adultery. It doesn't have to be the penalty. Remember, if you put the, to death, let's say a man sleeps with your wife and they're caught. If, if you put the man to death, you can't leave the woman alive. They both have to receive equal punishment. 
So if you want your wife back, if you want to forgive your wife and make recomp and, and work things out with your wife, you have to allow him to pay a monetary recompense. You can't put him to death. You can't put him to death and leave her alive. So Van Ernie just simply doesn't know the Old Testament law very well. <clears throat> Van Drunen makes the common error of teaching that God's law requires the death penalty for adultery in all cases. The death penalty was the maximum penalty allowed. It was rarely applied, and it was not permitted at all when the Jews were under Rome's authority. While it is true that Jesus does go beyond requirements of the civil law uh, in his exposition, as Van Drunen notes, this procedure is because he is speaking of the whole moral law not just the civil laws that have moral content. If you study the Sermon on the Mount, and I've written a 650-page book on the Sermon on the Mount, if you study the Sermon on the Mount in detail, you'll see that uh, when Jesus is expounding the moral law to the Jews and the fact that these moral laws are going to be more strictly enforced in his kingdom than what the Jews were doing, uh, he talks about not only civil case laws, but he talks about flat-out just regular moral laws that have no penalties. He talks about both. And, and this is further evidence that anything that's moral and content from the Old Testament still applies today. Our Lord is using this. He said, this is for my kingdom. One of the main errors that we see Christ correcting was the scribal tendency to view the moral law in an external manner only. Remember, they taught you could be saved by keeping the law. Well, people who teach that you can be saved by keeping the law, what do they do? They externalize it so it's easier to keep. Yeah, I've been married 34 years. 34 years, never committed adultery, never touched another woman. But lust, that's another problem. You know, that, you know, internal things, you know, Paul said, look, when I understood the, the 10th commandment about covetousness, I realized what a rotten sinner I am. That's the issue. Our Lord emphasized that it applies also to our thoughts or hearts and our tongues or speech. Does Van Druen believe that the Mosaic law allowed insults, unjust anger, hatred, easy divorce over virtually anything, and perverted lust, does he believe that? I hope not. For these reasons, the vast majority of expositors reject Van Drunen's position and adhere to the standard orthodox view that Jesus rejected distortions and human additions of the Old Testament moral laws and not the law itself. Okay, we're going to take a little break. We'll come back, <clears throat> and I have much more on Van Drunen's view of the New Testament and the Sermon on the Mount. I have, I have quite a bit more, but I hope you're seeing, it, you know, it's just sloppiness, exegetical sloppiness on his part. He's trying to prove a paradigm. It's, his presuppositions are shading his exegesis and perverting his, and he's twisting scripture here. And that's the most unfortunate because he's, he's quite a good scholar. But we'll, we'll come back in a minute. Let us pray. Father, we thank you that Jesus came and expounded the law so we could understand it even better. And we thank you, of course, that he fulfilled it perfectly by his life. Not one sin. He fulfilled the law in our place. And when we believe in him, our sins are removed at the cross in full. All the guilt, all the liability of punishment is removed. Expiated by his blood. God is propitiated. His wrath is removed. And we thank you, Lord, that his perfect righteousness, his perfect positive righteousness is reckoned to our account, imputed to us. And therefore, when you look upon us, you don't see our rotten, filthy, sin-stained lives of one sin after another, but you see the perfect righteousness of Jesus Christ. We thank you for that, Lord. So help us to live a life of thankfulness in terms of that. In Jesus' name.